Welcome back to the Hank Strange Situation, Lifestyles of the Locked and Loaded. Make sure to check out HankStrange.com. You can sign up for our email list and find ways to follow and support our efforts. Let me see. I'm going to introduce Owen. I think you're the one that reached out to me, right? Yeah, yeah. I, okay. uh, I reached Owen. out after uh, one of your episodes uh, with our, our buddies there at Liberty Suppressors, uh, okay. Dave. Dave and his family, um, you know, they were early participants in in starting the ASA. They were at some of the very early formative meetings. So, mm-hmm. uh, you know, we've always followed them. And uh, so, yeah, I just I saw that and I said, hey, let's let's talk suppressors. OK, cool. So, thanks. For, thanks for doing that. What do you do at the American uh, Suppressor Association? Yeah, so I've been with ASA for about four years now after about 10, almost 11 years at, at a at Gentech. Mm-hmm. You know that name. Uh, for 11 years, moved over to ASA, and uh, I'm the director of outreach. So okay. my job is to interact with our members and and connect them with with industry, and just share as much about the suppressor industry as we can with them. Okay, I hope that everyone heard that because someone who shall remain nameless, Richard, <laughs> was making a lot of noise just now. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. yeah yeah, he's still doing it. No, stop yeah. it, Richard. Mute, <laughs> mute yourself. Mute yourself. So, uh, okay, all right, all right. Let's get to Knox. Knox, um, tell us, tell the audience out there who you are and what you do at the ASA. Yeah, man. So I'm Knox Williams, the executive director at American Suppressor Association. Um, this was kind of my idea back when I used to work at Advanced Armament. Uh, mm-hmm. Wanted to be able to hunt suppressor in Georgia. Knew we couldn't. Knew that the best way to do that was form an association, kind of a nonprofit group where we could all work together. So uh, fast forward about nine years, and here we are. Okay, awesome. So um, I don't know which one of you guys wants to do it. I mean, either one of you is welcome to. Can you explain to the folks out there what the ASA, American Suppressor Association, is? Uh, Obviously, you said it started in 2011. What else should folks know about you guys? Yeah, man. So essentially, we are kind of the nonprofit that represents the suppressor community. And that's everything from manufacturers and distributors to dealers and consumers. Mm-hmm. Um, so our whole is advanced for suppressor reform, um, you know, at the state level and the federal level um, through things like legalizing suppressor ownership in all 50 states, legalizing suppressor hunting in all 50 states. For a while, we worked on shall sign. That was when the Clio certification was still a thing. Uh, we helped get rid of Clio certification, um, and that was a bit of a, a cluster. There were a lot of moving parts when that happened. Uh, we can get into that later, but uh, um, at the federal level, our goal is to get suppressors taken out of the National Firearms Act. They never should have been there in the first place. Um, they absolutely should be taken out, um, and really at, at our core, like that's our mission, right? Um, that's the end game uh, that we're, we're trying to see. Um, in the meantime, um, while we work on that, you know, we want to see wait times decrease. We want to get rid of the tax. We want to do a lot of different things. Um, but at the end of the day, it all focuses on suppressors. And that's that's intentional uh, because we wanted to separate our issue from other core Second Amendment issues that might turn off legislators at both the state and federal levels who say, I don't touch gun stuff. Well, this is a bit different than gun stuff. And, and it's been for us in terms of opening doors across the aisle for folks that generally wouldn't vote Mm pro-gun, a lot of them pro-suppressor. Right, yeah, and while while you were talking there, I'm trying to roll in uh, the website. There isn't a website, uh, America Suppressor Association. What is it? uh, It's .com, right? Yeah. For the folks who want to go there, there's lots of information on there. I'll probably uh, refer back to this, or if you guys, while we're talking here, you know, if there's something that comes up and it's on the website, if you let me know, I'll be happy to go to the website and point it out to people. Um, you know, uh, I'm guessing that's the reason why. Obviously, you guys want to come on talk about a lot of things uh, that are going on, uh, not just in the the gun community and the gun world. Obviously, like we've got uh, the highest sales levels in I don't know ever, right? Yeah, <laughs> just keeps breaking records. Um, just this 2020 is just that kind of year. You yeah, know, suppressors are no different. Suppressors okay. are trending. That way this year too we may not hit the highest levels uh mm-hmm. you know 2016 was a was a real peak just because of the legislation that was happening mm-hmm. uh yeah. full changes mm-hmm. um atf 41f and we can we can get into that one too but mm-hmm. but 
this will probably be the second highest year um, in history. And it may actually, talking to some of our dealers and distributors, it may eclipse 2016 this year as well. Really? So, okay. So yeah. you're saying that like 2016 was uh, was the highest year ever? Yeah, yeah. Okay. To date, 2016, um, you know, ATF publishes um, mm-hmm. their, their NFA data, some of their NFA data every Every year in August, they, mm-hmm. they publish a firearms commerce in the United States report. And in, in that, it includes a bunch of NFA data. But uh, okay. 2016, they received uh, about 312,000 Form 4 applications. Okay. Uh, suppressors generally make up about 80%, a little over 80% of all the Form 4s. Mm-hmm. Uh, ERs are kind of the other big chunk, and then you got a few transferable machine guns and short barrel shotguns and things mixed in there, but mm-hmm. suppressors are the bulk. Okay. Uh, now, for those that remember in 2016, Knox was kind of talking about the Clio sign-off, that law enforcement sign-off. So ATF, for several years, 2014, 2015, was, was proposing a rule, ATF 41P, which P stands for proposed, mm-hmm. um, and that made some changes to how Form 4 applications, Form 1 applications were filed. Most notably, it was the trust applications. Um, Prior to that, you could submit a trust, and because trusts are an entity, not a person, they didn't require any fingerprints or photographs uh, to go with it. Uh, Instead, a NICS check was usually run by the person picking the suppressor up once the Form 4 was approved. So ATF proposed changing that, and they proposed requiring all uh, responsible parties on a trust. So anyone with access to the firearm trust would have to um, get fingerprinted, photographed, and also get a Clio signature, which, you know, like for, for instance, my trust, I've got my brother who lives in Los Angeles. How's he supposed to get a, mm-hmm. uh, a Clio sign off in Los Angeles? He can easily send me some fingerprints and photographs. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, imagine, Clio's- and there's, there's companies that are in those trusts that I don't know, they have maybe 20, 30 people or something, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there were definitely some some trusts. I know personally of a couple of like gun clubs where they had every gun club member in the trust mm-hmm. and just so they could move stuff around. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, that's that's a question for the lawyers as to whether that's a good idea or not. I'm not a lawyer, so uh, <laughs> that's that's really not a good idea. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No. We can we can all say that's probably not a good idea. But, right. But we'll leave it to the lawyers to issue the legal advice. Right. Uh, so anyhow, um, you know, with that proposed rule. Um, The ATF kind of sat on it. They tweaked it. They had a big comment period. Um, That was where ASA really got involved. Um, And and Knox can really give some of the more finite details on on exactly what what ASA did to Mm -hmm. to help get rid of that Clio sign off. But in the end, uh, January or yeah, January 4th of 2016, they announced that they were finally going to implement that rule as ATF 41F, which is F for final rule. Um, and the, the deadline for that impl- implementation was mid-July, so they kind of gave about a six-month grace period that mm-hmm. from, from when they said, yeah, it's going to be final to when it actually took effect. And so that's when really the sales really spiked. Um, ATF in that time period received 276,000 Form 4s. I mean, basically yeah. about two-and-a-half-year um buying period i mean what mm-hmm. what would normally occur in about two and a half years so 2015 they received 130,000 right or so um a huge spike in demand um and then once that rule took effect the the demand really dropped off they only received another 36,000 form fours the rest of that that year mm-hmm. so you can really tell that 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 atf 41f was what what spiked that demand okay uh, and then 2017, we kind of returned to roughly normal. We were about 110,000 Form 4s total. So just about a 20%, eh, 15% decrease from what 2015 was. Um, so, you know, again, this year we're looking, our forecast is somewhere about 280,000 Form 4s. So okay. we're pretty close to that peak level, but we may exceed it. Okay. There's a, there's a whole bunch of things. I'm sure folks out there may have some questions as well. Um, can we start here? Like, how about we say, how about we let the folks know, like, 
what's the organizational structure of the ASA, right? Who who's behind it? Is this a grassroots effort? Is you know what exactly what exactly are we talking about here? Yeah. So mm -hmm. so we are somewhere in between like a trade association and a grassroots effort. Right okay. now we've got five thousand members, individual members of the public mm -hmm. um, who are in the association ballpark. Um, and that's something that we're looking to grow. Uh, we, we were pretty successful in the past year of, of growing that about 1,200 or so. Our ideal spot is 20 to 30,000. That's kind of our target for now. And once we hit that, you know, we'll continue to try to grow. Um, but at our core, um, you know, we represent the overwhelming majority of the industry. Um, so right now we've got a board of directors of, of 15 folks, largely CEOs and owners of major, you know, gun manufacturers and suppressor related companies. Um, and we try to balance kind of the interests of the industry and the interests of uh, the consumer um, because, you know, they align most of the time. They don't always. Um, but, you know, our job is whatever it is, as long as it's pro suppressor, we're pushing it. Right. So, like, I'm taking a look here at... Um... And this is all this is all information you guys are putting uh, all this stuff out there, right? So people can find this on the website. Yeah. Um, I'm yeah. showing the page that you have here, your sponsors. I see yeah. uh, the silencer shop. That looks like a tier one. So I'm gonna you know I'm gonna say that's like the big the big dog in there. I see Daniel Defense as well in there as a tier two, and then a bunch of different companies: uh, NASGW, Dead Air, Gemtech, Brownells. Uh, Gearfire, Lipsies, Orchid Advisors, Rugged Suppressors, Sig, uh, Silencer Co. This symbol looks like here. Shorefire, YHM, yep. right? So people, yes. co companies. Uh, I, I'm gonna say, I guess the bigger companies in the uh, suppressor world. Is that accurate? Yep. Or at least in manufacturing. Yeah, and we don't discriminate. Yeah. We want everybody to be involved. Okay. Um, you know, whether they're big or small, um, that's mm -hmm. why we have different tier structures within our sponsorship because mm -hmm. we want everybody to feel like they have a seat at the table okay. and the ability to help you know us steer the ship. Um, at the end of the day, we represent them and their interests, and and you know we want to make sure that their voice is heard. Okay, so any so any individual can um, can sponsor, or how does this work? Is it like sponsorship membership? How do those work, and how do the sponsorships work? Because so you've got tiers here, so I'm assuming the higher tiers, more money, something like that. That's good. Yeah, so break it into like corporate sponsorship structure and an individual sponsorship, more membership based. Mm -hmm. uh, the for our corporate sponsors, that operates on a calendar year. Um, we have a threshold for a monetary contribution that will buy you voting rights within the association, uh, and essentially that allows you to help us elect the board of directors. Mm -hmm. um, anything from the tier three up they all have voting rights within the association. Mm -hmm. uh, anything below that tier four and down, they don't, but they still, we still like to get them involved um, as much as possible. Um, so we allow them to, to join our board calls and things like that. Um, and any sort of in-person meetings that we host, generally at SHOT Show in our annual meeting, things like that, mm -hmm. uh, we'll invite them to those as well. Okay. Um, on the public membership side, um, that generally operates on a you know 365 day year period. So if you signed up today, uh, you know, your membership would run until July 8th of next year. Um, and, uh, you know, that's it's a pretty generic, basic membership, you know, 35 bucks for a year, 100 bucks for three years, 1000 bucks for a lifetime membership. Um, and we're really working right now on trying to build some of the perks up, um, you know, discounts with different companies um, and kind of exclusive opportunities for folks that uh, do become members for us. Okay, very cool. Um, I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that, Owen, or if you had any questions, Rich, feel free to jump in here uh, with any questions. Um, one that comes, yeah. go ahead, go ahead, Owen. Yeah, I'll just jump in kind of to touch mm -hmm. on Knox's statements about the membership. So the, mm -hmm. again, the public membership, that's, you know, essentially you're funding, you're funding the advocacy work that Knox and I do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're on the road a um, hundred days a year. Normally, this year, obviously, uh, our travel kind of cut off. In fact, I haven't been to a shot show. Mm -hmm. uh, but in a normal year, we're we're traveling. We're on the road. We're in the states. We're in the state legislatures. We're in the we're we're in the Capitol um, in D.C. We're at ATF headquarters. You know, we're meeting with those people representing um, the the desires and the, and the needs of, of suppressor owners and, and suppressor manufacturers and distributors and dealers. Um, and so that's really what that, that membership is, is helping fund, you know, a, a plane ticket to, to Washington DC for most of us is a $500 endeavor, um, maybe more. And so, mm -hmm. you know, your 35 bucks 
keeps you from having to buy that plane ticket and get there yourselves because mm-hmm. we're there. We're yeah. Your interests. Are you guys like lobbyists? Um, uh, you know, are you just doing a little bit of everything? Just, you know, I'm trying to wrap my head around the whole thing. Is it, are you like the NRA? You know, what would we compare like other organizations that are out there? You like the GOA, for example? How, how does everything work back there? And how many people are actually there in, in, in the uh, in the actual structure of the organization? Yeah. So right now you're looking at our full-time staff. Um, our goal the, is You two guys? Be, yep. Yeah. That's yeah. it? Fighting for suppressors? That's yeah. It. So okay. We've got, we've got some contractors as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and we had a contract lobbyist on retainer in D.C. for, what, four or five years. Okay. Okay. Um, it was great. And, you mm-hmm. know, frankly, like when we started up in D.C., we really we had never gotten our feet wet. You know, we mm-hmm. needed someone to kind of show us the ropes and teach us how it's done. Um, and he was fantastic with that. Mm-hmm. Um, over the course of the past, you know, shoot, nine years at this point, we've really kind of learned the game, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, our our strength isn't we're never going to be the 800 pound gorilla in the room. We're never going to wield that big stick. We're the subject matter. Right. We know suppressor advocacy forward and backwards, we've really shaped the arguments that have pushed the the dial at both the state and federal levels. Mm-hmm. Um, so we go and we, we help, we draft legislation. Uh, we push that legislation, but our strength really comes from working with other organizations who do have those built-in relationships and who do carry those big sticks. Um, so one of our first things was, you know, getting in with the guys at the NRA. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I like it or not, and they definitely have some some flaws and things that need to be addressed. You know, and that's that's outside of the scope of this right, conversation. Right, right, absolutely, yeah. I mean, I would say that you know, the reason why I'm interested in it is because I think it's 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 you know it's a good idea to have some organization out there every day thinking about this section, right? Uh, I don't know. It's kind of a weird thing. Uh, su- suppressors are not legal everywhere. But in in a lot more states nowadays, right? Um, I think they're awesome. I think every single firearm should have a suppressor on it. But it's, you know, uh, someone's got to be out there representing somehow fighting for this particular thing. But just because you know we're getting attacked when it comes to the Second Amendment on so many different levels. So I don't I don't find a, a problem with you guys working with the NRA. That's a place where a lot of gun people go to. Versus let's say like Shot Show, that's you know inside the industry. The 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 uh, the folks out there who are just into guns can go to NRA, and I believe that I came to at least one, if not two, events that you guys put on during NRA. That's usually yeah. off-site, right? Yeah, yeah, we yeah. get to do an annual meeting. Yeah, um, yeah, because yeah. I think I remember doing. I at least remember doing one in Kentucky. I think. Yep, mm-hmm. at Knob Creek. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay, so that so you guys are doing a little bit of everything here. You're you're you've got uh, m- maybe guys out there uh, blocking legal like bills that are trying to go in effect. You know, all all kinds of different things you guys are up to, right? Yeah, so that's a, and we work with you know the NRA, Congressional Sportsman's Foundation, mm-hmm. National Sportsman's Foundation, other groups in mm-hmm. state as, um, and really try to work out the, a team strategy of okay, what's the political dynamic. What's the political makeup? Mm-hmm. Who's going to be the most effective targeting, you know, what specific legislators? And mm-hmm. we really got our battle plan and execute. Yeah. Uh, good. Richard, Owen, do you guys have something here? Um, I'm looking. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, one of the things uh, you'll notice, maybe Knox's shirt. Um, yeah. You know, we're pretty much on the one year anniversary of. of uh, yeah, let me, yeah, let me. Yeah, let me go. Uh, yeah, there you go. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Virginia was a huge, you know, Second Amendment battleground state last year you know a year mm-hmm. ago even six months ago um yeah. in that special session there last year and then the regular session this year and, mm-hmm. and Knox and I spent weeks on the ground in virginia um mm-hmm. working that and and defending suppressors specifically right alongside a lot of other groups you mm-hmm. know bcdl and nra and 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 other orgs that were you know, looking at the broader 2a issue there in virginia mm-hmm. um but we wanted to make sure that, you know, suppressors being on the docket that they were talking originally about banning and, and even confiscating or requiring legally owned suppressors to be turned in. Mm-hmm. You know, we wanted to make sure that 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 specific issue was also getting attention uh, and, and didn't get lost in that in that bigger conversation about 2A. And that's, um, you know, we were there organizing um, gun owners and suppressor owners and we went out and canvassed dealers and 
and specifically targeted dealers and, and individuals that were in, in some of the key swing districts there. And, uh, and then, you know, we walked the halls for days of the, the office buildings there, the, the legislative office buildings and, and took meetings with members on, on both sides of the issues, you know, making sure that, that the people that supported suppressors continued to support them. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and the people that, that were maybe more anti-gun, we, we spent some time educating them and, and, mm-hmm. you know, in the final, final drafts, they, we, we talked to a few members and said, Hey, we specifically, you know, changed some of the language in these bills because of the education, you know, we didn't realize that they were so tightly regulated at the federal level. Um, and, and so because of that, we're, we're going to back off, you know, trying to ban them. Mm-hmm. Um, Knox, you got any, anything to add on, on Virginia? Yeah, and that was, you're touching on specifically the confiscation aspect of it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's it's things that legislators often don't think through the ramifications of their legislation. They get an idea, they push it through, you know, um, legislative council and pretty much whatever they want to do, they push. Um, but, you know, it's it's easy for us to recognize pretty immediately there's a lot of logistical issues if you're going to try to confiscate, not the least of which is these are federally controlled items that are in legal possession and you're going to have state um, authorities take illegal possession of them. And we made sure that we were highlighting that point, which is something that we thought about. Yeah, um, so a lot. That, yeah. Yeah, I was going to say a lot of uh, people out there that don't know any better don't realize we already have a lot of regulation, in my opinion, too much regulation yeah. um, out there. And, and just, these people just don't know. Uh, there's so many examples that we could give of that. Make sure to check out HankStrange.com. You can sign up for our email list and find ways to follow and support our efforts.